Good morning, everyone. University. Can you hear me all right? Yes, please begin, Professor. Thank you. I'm happy to join you today, though disappointed not to be in Zanzibar personally. A big thank you to Professor Rugaya Abu Sharaf and the AI team, Satan, Sarah, Isra, for the chance to honor Professor Abdul Sharif today. Although I'm neither from Africa nor Arabia, I think it is of great significance that the Africa Institute has been established in Sharjah with the following vision. The fact on the ground is that the Arab Gulf region is one of mixed populations in which cultural exchanges manifested in an impressive variety of processes, patterns pertaining to borrowing and assimilation, forced and voluntary migrations and adaptive strategies, none of which can be fully understood without incorporating Africa into the analysis. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I've been involved in a similar enterprise at the other end of the Indian Ocean, the Muhammad Alagil Chair in Arabia Asia Studies at the National University of Singapore. The founder, Mr. Alagil of Saudi Arabia, who is with you in the conference today, was driven by the vision that the deep trade, religious, and kinship relations between Arabia and Asia needed to be studied and understood. These links were by and large peaceful in contrast with the conflicts and wars that mark both their relations with the West. I see these two institutions as picking up where the Zanzibar Indian Ocean Research Institute or Ziori left off when it sadly closed in 2012. To my mind, the three form a research triangle linking Africa, Arabia and Asia. I had been surprised and honored to be invited by Professor Abdul Sharif to his opening conference and join his board in 2008. I had worked on Hadramaut in South Arabia and its diaspora in India and Southeast Asia, but had not had the chance to follow in its East African footsteps. Now, wherever one is positioned around the Indian Ocean, one cannot understand the place without knowing something about its connections with other places around the ocean. Societies on its rim are only partial societies that have been shaped by intercourse with mobile peoples from other partial societies across the ocean. People in Zanzibar, Sharjah, and Singapore instinctively know this. They know it from their food, languages, families, neighbors, and politics. The Emporium port cities host populations and religions originating from Africa, Arabia, India, the Malay Archipelago, and China in varying combinations and proportions in each place. These are the original plural societies and tribes. These are the original plural societies for whom God's words in the Holy Quran truly apply. We have made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. In them, diasporas are normal rather than exceptional. They have overlap coexisted, partnered, trade, raided, fought, and intermarried over centuries, creating new societies out of oceanic connections. Some have even emerged with their own names, such as Swahilis, Mapilas, and Pranakans. These are only the visible tips of the iceberg. Now, why is it important to recite yet again the significance of the Indian Ocean and its plural society in this conference on race and slavery? It is important because the range of relations and experiences found in this arena have been reduced by a notion of the plural society as one in which different ethnic groups meet only in the marketplace but do not combine. In Furnival's original formulation, plural society, I quote, is in the strictest sense a medley for they mix but do not combine. Each group holds by its own religion, its own culture and language, its own ideas and ways. As individuals, they meet, but only in the marketplace, with different sections of the community living side by side, but separately within the same political unit. Even in the economic sphere, there is division of labor along racial lines. Natives, Chinese, Indians, and Europeans all have different functions, and within each major group, sub subsections have particular occupations." Unquote. Pernival, a former Indian ser civil service official in colonial Burma and a Fabian socialist turned pro-native activist, was characterizing Southeast Asia under colonial rule. And his plural society concept was the lament 
on how extreme marketization under colonial rule had dissolved the range of social ties and reduced all parties to a subset of their full cultural selves. Even European music had been reduced to that of a marching band in the colonies. His solution for colonies to become independent nations in which a shared national will could be created was to be dogged by the presumed physiparous state of the colonial plural society. Scholars of the Caribbean, such as M.G. Smith, took Furnival's plural society idea a step further. Conflict was assumed to be inherent to ethnic separation, and the built-in potential for violence could only be contained by a le leviathan state, whether colonial or independent. While many of us has, have lived and continue to experience the inter-ethnic conflicts that have apparently been built into the post-colonial states from the ground up, those raised in the port and poorer cities of the Indian Ocean, like my hometown Penang Island, have had a more expansive experience of the cultural continuum that belies the reductions of a culturally impoverished, racialized, plural society that continue to be milked by national politicians as part of their colonial inheritance. This is where the Indian Ocean, and on one of its great inspiring scholars, Professor Abdul Sharif, come in. He was lucky to have grown up in Zanzibar, and we are lucky that he has turned his instincts into illuminating research conveyed in very clear analytical prose. In the preface to his masterpiece, Dao Cultures of the Indian Ocean, he says, quote, I grew up in Zanzibar, one of the numerous Dao parks skirting the Indian Ocean. Every monsoon, the town was almost transformed by the arrival of the monsoon Daos and sailors from Arabia, the Persian Gulf, India, Somalia. I therefore became conscious of the intermingling of the peoples of the Indian Ocean, which underlay the cosmopolitan character of Zanzibar, of which I was myself a product." Quote. In 1964, when he was finishing up his first degree at UCLA, the Zanzibar revolution exploded. His idealized, if not romantic, experience of an innocent childhood in Zanzibar must have ended with a shock, as the racialized politics of native African versus Arab land owners with wealth built on African slave labor culminated in the massacre of perhaps 5,000 Arabs and the exile of perhaps another 100,000 people at the end of colonial rule. Abdul Sharif was not sure at that time whether he could return home from Los Angeles or whether he was already in exile. Zanzibar 1964 seemed to exemplify the sort of plural society Furnival painted, taken to its logical conclusion of violence when race and class were aligned. How to reconcile this with a very different sort of Indian Ocean plural society Abdul Sharif had grown up knowing in Zanzibar? I believe the tragic gap between the Zanzibar of his childhood and the Zanzibar of his sudden and forced adulthood in 1964 created a tension that has driven his research trajectory. I suggest that that tension may be conceptualized as a gap as the gap between a reduced notion of the plural society as formulated by Furnival and an expansive sense of the plural society Abdul Sharif experienced in Zanzibar, in his Zanzibari childhood. I imagine a range of questions would have been thrown up by such a consequential gap. Did Zanzibar change from an expansive to a reduced type of plural society? If so, when did this start to happen? What was the process? Who or what was responsible? Or was the problem one of perception through deliberate political mobilization, <clears throat> intellectual misunderstanding, or some combination of the two? Most importantly, a hypothetical. Was it all water under the bridge or could history in fact be reversed? The way he went about seeking question, answers to these questions, I think, is of relevance to the two important themes of this conference, slavery and the comparison between Indian Ocean and Atlantic cases. Let me try to suggest why. His first major book, Slaves, Spices and Ivory in Zanzibar, Integration of an East African Commercial Empire, into the world economy, 1770 to 1873, 
sought to understand the rise and decline of two e classes of economic elites in Zanzibar under the rule of the Omani sultans, who were themselves becoming wealthy, controlling the flow of exports while navigating superior British power. While English people had previously made enormous profits in the West Indies and North America in agriculture on slave plantations, a new English national consensus arose in the 19th century, driven by manufacturing interests, Christian nonconformists, rising professional classes, and new print media calling for free trade, free competition, free wage labor, denouncing monopoly in all its forms, including over freedom itself, that is, slavery. Adam Smith's moral and economic philosophy said it best. His Wealth of Nations, published the year the United States gained its independence, denounced the Atlantic colonial system of slavery, monopoly, the need for costly organized violence, and the resulting high prices and low volumes. Instead of an oceanic economy of slaves from Africa, working land in America, enabled by capital from England, a return home to English land, working, working English, working, um, free English labor and freely competitive English capital would create an English factoring workshop to generate even greater wealth than their lost slave plantations of America and would be morally superior to boot. So armed with these ideas, British state and commerce swung to the East Indies, employing the new stick of abolition to measure the legitimacy of native policies, transform or take them over open up import and export markets for Eastern primary resources and British manufacturers and free their internally oppressed. Now viewed from Zanzibar and the Western Indian Ocean more broadly, this push came with exaggerated charges against Arabs as pirates and exporters of slaves from East Africa, which underwrote British Dow chasing in Zanzibar waters to muscle in on trade in Arab and Indian hands across the Western Indian Ocean and on the Omani Sultan's grip on a key funnel through which trade flowed, Zanzibar. In Abdul Shari's view, while the number of slaves exported by Arab mariners was much smaller than inflated British estimates, the joint action of British restrictions against slave exports, 1822-1845, Coupled with the rising international demand for cloves newly planted in Zanzibar, ironically meant an increase in the number of slaves, now redirected from maritime export to work on land in Zanzibar plantations. In short, there was a new turn of Arab economic activity away from oceanic trade towards production on land for export to metropoles using slaves. For a while, this generated great surplus wealth for the new class of Arab plantation owners, including the Sultan, as clove export prices kept rising as demand outstripped supply, while imported manufacturers kept falling in price. When it suited them, the British could close one eye to slavery as if it was one removed from them, out of sight in plantations, but generating wealth on the market. The larger story for our purposes here is that in reorienting themselves from wide ranging oceanic trades, which included slaves, but only as one part towards land in the form of clove plantations worked by even more slaves, Arabs fell into a double historical trap. First, by from being wide ranging maritime traders, even periodic ones, they became identified very visibly as owners of slaves resident in Zanzibar. This rise of a land owning class of Arabs owning African slaves is part of the process of a reduction in the form of the plural society in Zanzibar. Aligning owner of land and African slaves with Arab ethnicity. It was also a reduction in perception as the high visibility of these Arab elites of wealth overshadowed the many other Arabs who were poor porters, laborers and shopkeepers and descendants of unions with Africans over generations as well. 
While Abdul Sharif's Marxian idea of a class of land and slave owners put Arabs into view within its conceptual frame, he is careful to note that individual Arabs fell in and out of that frame, as did Indians. Second, the move of Arabs from sea to land was also one from a diversified economy to one overly dependent on one sector, slaves producing clothes. They became indebted to Indian land money, land, money lenders when cloth prices fell, even losing their land to them. And when slavery was totally abolished in 1873, they became impoverished. Abdul Sharif produced a, a similar view of reduction in terms of the association of Indians with the mercantile class. Many had come from Kutch in Gujarat poor as British cloth disp displaced Indian cloth there. They got their start with credits advanced by American traders using the facility to trade in the interior. The Sultan cultivated them as they expanded the reach of his economic hinterland, financing Arabs and Swahilis in the caravan trade for ivory and slaves. The biggest among them in turn came to provide advances to the Sultan's treasury as well, as the customs tax farmers for Zanzibar's trade. The complementary relationship between Sultan, between Indian merchant financiers and the Sultan meant that the Indians were becoming indigenized as pillars of Zanzibari polity and society. Overall, the identification of Arabs with land and slave ownership and Indians with merchant finance arose from the creation of economic classes that were part and parcel of the political economy of the Zanzibar state. It was the political economy that fed the rich international markets to which British overlordship gave access. In turn, it made the Sultan and his localized Arab and Indian commercial partners fabulously wealthy for a good number of decades during the 19th century. This wealth from a political economy that was based on land products created in gross form a plural society with inordinately visible wealth in two distended sectors with Indian and Arab faces, ivory from the hunt and clothes from plantations, presided over by an Arab Omani ruler. In the larger scheme of things, they were all merely a sub-regional secondary transmission belt that fed a world market run by Englishmen who were overlords in both money and power, who had also taken over the oceanic realm. It was the loss of this oceanic realm that reshaped the previously ocean-based plural societies of Port Emporia like Zanzibar. In this groundbreaking book, Abdul Sharif made the case eloquently that to understand enslavement of East Africans in 19th century East Africa and its relation with Arab, Indian, and Islamic lands and peoples one needed to bring in the Indian Ocean as a foil or baseline to shape the extent of, to gauge and shape the extent of social transformation. I will add that at this time, it was wholly unusual to look at the, to the ocean because most of the national historians, nationalist historians were writing, looking at the land. So this was, um, this move to global and oceanic history was completely innovative uh, by Abdul Sharif. Despite the official British cudgel of abolition, slave making ironically expanded because it was now yoked to a greatly expanded regional pr production for a world capitalist market. These conditions of production of slavery were specific to variables of space, time, and circumstance and could not be generalized to atemporal or long durée relations between classes, races, religions, or geographical regions. While his first major book studied the reduction of the plural society in the Indian Ocean, his more recent masterpiece, Tao Cultures of the Indian Ocean, has gone in the opposite direction. Unlike slave spices and ivory in Zanzibar, which link reduction to a turn to the land, Tao Cultures explicitly embraces and expands the range of plural societies to be found across the Indian Ocean, across a wide space and deep time. Here, slavery is given one chapter as part of the larger cultural world of the Indian Ocean. Going earlier than the Vasco da Gama period, the Europeans are done away with. 
Correspondingly, the treatment of slavery here is less tight and more capacious. In a repost to the 19th century Western stereotypes of Islam as central to slaving, Abdul Sharif examines the provisions for the treatment of slaves and manumission of slaves in Quran, Hadith, and practice. Islam neither invented nor abolished slavery. He says what it tried to do was to ameliorate the conditions through, re through regulations and exhortations for the treatment of slaves and to provide for numerous ways for a slave to move out of servility. Islam thus built in a system of manum manumission that provided a path to freedom and to integration into society. Slave mothers of children with Muslim fathers were freed on the death of their masters. 34 Abbasid caliphs were born of slave mothers who were Berbers, Iranians, Greeks, Turks, Africans. Wars, disasters generated slaves. There was no single dominant racial axis, such as white and black, around which slaves were enslaved. Slaves could become kings, nobles, generals, as in India and the Middle East. As well as slaves were oppressed and revolted. <clears throat> Attention to context matters. In an echo of his first book, the chapter discusses the Zanj rebellions in 19th century southern Iraq under the Abbasids. There, a concentration of slaves to ramp up agricultural production on a large scale created the conditions for revolt. The label Zanj identifies the slaves as Black Africans, but free Arabs and free Persians joined in the revolt as well. They all shared an intense hatred of the caliphate and the large land and slave owners of Basra. African slaves fought on and deserted from both sides. The rebels at one point set up their own state, which, however, did not abolish slavery. Through these Indian Ocean examples of slavery in a cross-section of plural societies, Abdul Sharif demonstrates that slave status, race, or origins were not necessarily aligned to function, unlike Furnival's plural society. Neither were slaves fixed in servitude, but could experience a range of degrees and types of social mobility. The broader spatio-temporal canvas of Tao cultures of the Indian Ocean serves as a counterpoint to the analysis in slave spices and ivory in Zanzibar. Whereas the Zanzibar book charted a reduction in plural society to approximate Furnival's formulation, the Tao cultures book displays an expansive view of plural societies. Even with those, even those with slaves in the cultural world of the Indian Ocean. Why is this expansion important? The expansion is important because it helps us recognize that Furnival's plural society shares important attributes with the North American Atlantic model of slavery. These are the reduction in relations between cultures of a plural society into two groups that meet that do not combine, the alignment of race with function, the conceptual formulations for separation and legal inequality, the potential for violence embedded in these categorical divisions, and the whole geared to wealth generations. To wealth generation, sorry. These similarities may indeed not be coincidental, but rather come out of a shared kinship in being Anglo-Saxon modes of creating new colonies abroad for super profits. Another way of saying this is to postulate that the North American Atlantic, Atlantic slave plantations were extreme versions of Furnival's plural society because they were reduced by cultural biracial societies by design. Unlike the Spaniards who conquered populous and wealthy South American polities, and enslave their natives in situ to mine the gold and silver that catapulted Spain to the top rank in European wealth and naval power, the Anglo-Saxons who came later to the poorer lands of North America had to mix labor with land to generate wealth more slowly through agriculture instead. John Locke's labor theory of value, which Karl Marx picked up unwittingly, was, in session, was essentially an argument that wealth was legitimately created by colonizers who added value to God-given but unimproved land. 
that value was created through labor on land, but its potential was only fully realized in an extended market that ultimately stretched back to England. For Locke, sovereignty derived not from relation of people to land, cutting out the natives, but solely from mobile people like the English who could deliver and withdraw it wherever they went. If those brought into work on the land were also transplanted peoples like the English, but slaves who were already property, regarded as wealth already generated by their owners, then their labors were merely extensions of their owners' prior, prior labors, and the value they generated rightly reverted to their masters. The racial difference enacted enacted as impermeable categorical legal, ba legal barriers between races, which could not be crossed even by biological miscegenation, unlike with the Spanish and French mestizos and Creoles, made for robust leak-proof channels for the transmission and accumulation of wealth on the one side, despite its generation as a joint project shared by white and black, master and slave, both colonizers in contradistinction to natives. Now, I believe such a tripartite design for colonial transplantation of Anglos and Africans across the Atlantic, separating them from each other and from the natives of the new land by employing a low-tech, readily available unified classification scheme based on unerasable colors already pre-stamped on human skin made rigid and impermeable across generations with the buttress of laws and enforced customs, despite the inevitable production of mixed offspring. The whole continuously stressed and strained by the hard work of generating inordinate wealth, harboring the potential, if not actual outbreaks of violence, and needing to be kept together by organized violence, such as imperial states, can provide such as imperial states can provide, is the ER model for the reproductions found in Furnival's model of the colonial plural society. I repeat, the North American Anglo-Saxon plantation, slave plantation model, I believe, is the ER model for the reductions found in Furnival's plural society. The key difference between this Anglo-American Atlantic model and the pre-existing plural societies of the Indian Ocean that it tried to shape in its image is that the peoples in the Indian Ocean were already pre-mixed, like the Swahilis and Mapilas, mobile, could not be easily separated into native and foreigner or colonizer, nor by skin color, and the lands they inhabited or sojourned on were by no stretch of the imagination terra nullius, lands without people, from which Europeans could extract without associating with natives. For the pre-existing port emporia and plural societies of the Indian Ocean to, approxim to approximate the designed, reduced plural societies of Anglo-Atlantic North America in the Furnivalian form, and for them to erupt in violence upon independence as Abdul Sharif's beloved Zanzibar did in 1964, must be to add insult to injury. The injury is not only physical, but cultural to boot, which gives rise to the question we asked before, can it be reversed? In both his major books we've, dis we've discussed, Abdul Sharif clearly blames the reduction on processes that began with the arrival of the Portuguese and the combination of trade and raid, trade and state that was refined with each iteration of European arrival at the end of the Dao book, he asks a hypothetical. What if the voyages of the massive Chinese ships under the command of the Muslim Admiral Cheng He, sent by the early Ming Emperor Yung Lo, had continued? What if an armed naval power like the Chinese, which abided by prevailing free trade norms in the Indian Ocean and did not seek monopoly advantage through geostrategic violence, had been present when the Portuguese arrived in the Indian Ocean. How would things have turned out differently? Well, President Xi Jinping of China today may be cooking up an answer for Professor Abdul Sharif even as we speak. 
with a string of pearls in his Belt and Road Initiative, threading through the erstwhile Anglo-Saxon girdle around the globe, now properly named, I would say, the Indo-Pacific Atlantic. I look forward to Abdul Shari's keynote on the tyranny of the Atlantic slavery and how an agenda for the study of Indian Ocean slavery might articulate a proper response to its insults. Thank you. <clears throat>